Hello folks and welcome back to World War II TV and I have been looking forward to this show and I have to offer a little bit of thank you to Trent Telenko who is watching, who was on the Japanese code show Radar all that a few weeks ago and he suggested this guest and what a, what a good idea that was. So credit where it's due, this wasn't one of my ideas, this is one of my viewers stroke guests ideas. So there we go. So as you know folks, in August, apart from Airborne Week coming up in about 15 days time, it's all kind of random shows we're coming at you with a whole variety of stories different theaters different aspects and it's good because it means i'm 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 I keeps my brain on the ball so tonight folks or this afternoon depending on where you are we are talking about the alamo scouts now if you're like me it's one of those units i'd heard of a long time ago i didn't know very much about them and probably what i knew was wrong because that's how it is when you first delve into a subject but I pride myself on World War II TV of bringing you the best experts I can on any particular subject, which means having set the benchmark quite high it is quite hard to find sometimes the right people. But in this case, Trent, thank you to Trent. Trent put me in the right direction. So my guest today, uh, Lance Edrick, is a teacher, author, and you are the um, official historian of the Alamo Scout Historical Foundation. So, frankly, I couldn't have got anyone better to talk about the Alamo Scout Scouts. So, how are you doing, Lance? I'm doing great, and I, I have to say thank you. Thank you to Trent for reaching out to you, and he's helped us with some, some source work and archival-type discoveries. He's done a fantastic job and always been a, 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 a champion of the Alamo Scouts, and we couldn't appreciate that more. And thanks again for having me. I'm really excited to to share some information about uh, what I feel is a, has been a long overlooked unit. Well, as we often say here, the ETO is so many people's fo uh, focus. And, you know, when we're talking about when I mean, we're focusing on Alamo Scouts, but the Sixth Rangers come in and most people who are watching could tell you a little bit about First Rangers and Second Rangers and maybe Fifth Rangers. But when you start getting to Sixth Rangers, it, it it all starts getting a little bit less information. The Alamo Scouts, as I said there in my introduction, you know, I knew about them a little bit, but I didn't know very much about them. So how did you get involved in the very early days with this? Because, you know, when you were just doing your pre-chat there, you're rattling off the names of people you knew and within this. I mean, it, it's an, it, you have met most of the guys. So where did it all begin for you? Well, I started out operating from a position of uh, of ignorance and along with a lot of other people with the Alamo Scouts. I was at Fort Bragg in 1992, just figure, finishing my tour, and I went to a gun show, and I saw this patch that said Alamo Scouts 6th Army. I thought, well, I majored in history. I've never heard of these guys. Who were they? And I thought, well, I took picked up the patch, and the, the dealer kind of looked at me like with a leery eye, and I saw $500 on the back of the patch. So what, what, who are these guys? And this man was an ex-Special Forces soldier. And he said, I don't know, but I know the patch is worth a lot of money. They operated somewhere in the Pacific. So fast forward several months, I'm back in Illinois at graduate school. And I thought, you know what? I need a thesis topic and I'm not going to rewrite the history of the French Revolution for the 1000th time. And I know nothing about it. So I thought of some obscure unit maybe I could write about. So I started delving into a little uh, about the Alamo Scouts in the local library and in the college library and found three footnotes. That was it. So I thought, well, I got to do something else. So I um, called the chief of military history, got through to him. And I said, who are the Alamo Scouts? He said, never heard of them. I said, oh, well, OK. He said, hold on a minute. Let me check my roster for phone numbers. And he had. And, well, I have an Alamo Scouts Association, Colonel Robert Sumner. I'll give you his phone number. And a couple minutes later, that's how I found out about the Alamo Scouts. And believe me, I was operating from a position of ignorance. So, Well, the, the weird thing is, uh, Lance, is that I don't want to go down a massive rabbit hole, is often that's the best way to go into a subject because <laughs> – when we talk about it on World War II TV, so many things, the big battles, the big units, we've learned things the wrong way because of the old historiography, the books that were written that weren't very good, the biographies by people who perhaps served but didn't, they inflated their stories perhaps or movies told them a bad way. So actually starting with a completely blank canvas is not a bad way to go because we were talking about Chris Millington last week about the French resistance in World War II and the French occupation. His students 
don't come with the baggage people like I come of all the TV series I saw when I was a kid. So <laughs> when he tells them, this is how it worked in France, this is what was going on here, they just take it on board. They don't go, but I've seen this TV show that said this. So it's not a bad stand starting point. So anyway, we've got an amazing amount of photos and things to go through. You provided probably the most comprehensive PowerPoint any of my guests has ever done. So um, we'll start it all off. I will jump in with my usual questions and clarifications and comments just to interrupt your throw, really. So when you need me to move on the next slide, just tell me move on and we'll, we'll go from there. And uh, I'm absolutely looking forward to this. I'm sure our viewers are too, because it's going to be very, very informative. So Alamo Scouts, over to you, Lance. All right. Um, here you see the official orders, Order 353B, signed on 28 November 1943, authorizing the Alamo Scouts to conduct raider and reconnaissance work in the Southwest Pacific. Now, you know raider and reconnaissance work. So somewhere in this planning, Kruger and his planners thought, you know what, we maybe we need a, a unit, a very small unit that can can conduct some direct action missions. Apart from the Rangers, apart from some of the other types of units were out there. So what Kruger do, prior to this, and he was a student of history, Kruger looked at some of the existing uh, units, and I'm gonna use the term special forces, although it didn't really apply at the time, but no. naval combat demolition units, uh, uh, some of the units, the Ranger units, amphibious scouts, those types. And he collected training plans from some of those units and studied their composition. Well, Kruger knew he was going to be in a, a very difficult geographical situation. And he was going to need to rely on a long range reconnaissance unit, somebody to go behind enemy lines and to scout out prior to amphibious landings. And he wanted an army asset, and I, I'll get into that a little bit uh, later, but um, he learned from partially from the Kiska operation, which you had a guest on yesterday. I about good fortuitous timing there, yeah. Yes, well, he didn't want to repeat with faulty intelligence because you know uh, his boss MacArthur could be a little unforgiving when it came to messing up. So Kruger was cautious by nature, but once he did make a move, you know he was pretty well studied on whatever he did. So I think he put a lot of forethought into the formation of the scouts, and he picked uh, Colonel Frederick W. Bradshaw, who was a a, a prominent attorney in Jackson, Mississippi, who had impressed him in the Louisiana maneuvers of 1940 as his first director of training. And the scouts were aptly named because of Alamo Force. Well, as, as your readers, I'm sure, or listeners, many of them know, um, Americans don't like putting their armies under foreign control. So Alamo Force was thusly named so we weren't putting, quote, Sixth Army under uh, General Sir Thomas Blamey's control. We were keeping it independent with the Sixth Army. Well, you could do that if, if you use the titular uh, moniker force. So they used Alamo force. And hence, since Kruger was from San Antonio, where he commanded the Third Army, they became the Alamo Scouts but the official name was the 6th Army Special Reconnaissance Unit. Good. And 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 tell us a little bit about Kruger's background. I mean, you just explained a little bit about it. he's kind of a history student and he is the commanding officer of 6th Army, but, you know, he's, he's is he a kind of an inventive kind of guy? He thinks outside the box. It's how he seems to me in my limited knowledge. Well, Kruger was born in Germany. In, in, in uh, Prussia around 1870, 71, and came to the United States in the Midwest. Um, he was bilingual, of course. Um, he, he never had formal college, but he touched all the ranks on the way up. He was a veteran of the, the Spanish-American War, uh, had served in the Philippines in, in the early 1900s, and he had been to uh, naval schools. He... I believe he tried to become a pilot, but washed out. Um, so he had a lot of military training, amphibious 
uh, schools. He went, I believe he went to the, um, um, studied naval amphibious warfare, a, a lot of, or, there was a lot on his plate. And he was 62 years old when he was selected by MacArthur to, to serve. So he was, he was a little long in the tooth, but uh, he, I, I think in, in a lot of ways, Kruger was not a person who would suck away any of the limelight from MacArthur. He was slow and steady and reliable. And I think MacArthur wanted that type of person in charge of the sixth army. And I think, you know, it's always good to have people who've got an experienced background from different armies, because as we've I been mean, a recurring theme, it'll come up later on about the cohesion of, of the raid we're going to be discussing later is armies and different units have different doctrines, different styles, different different approaches. And the more experience you have of how other forces work, you can borrow the best bits of certain armies and the best bits of certain um, doctrines and kind of drop the worst bits and create your own kind of melded force. And as we'll we'll discuss later on by 1945 the allies the americans in this case are are using that experience they have gained in places like kiska and new guinea earlier and we'll talk about new guinea in a minute i'm sure but they're, they're putting behind them the bad experiences and taking forward the good ideas and the good practices to use for things like this and when we get to the, the famous raid in 45 it's a uh, it's it's foundations of that success has been laid by all the four running units that have been paving the way and learning by their mistakes so um, we'll keep on going. So tell, do, tell, do, do remind me when to keep on moving on with the slides because yeah. I'm going to be mesmerized what you're saying. So um, okay. and some of these are absolutely amazing images. So just tell me tell me when to stop and tell me when to move. All right. This here you see is a, is a color image taken at the time in color of uh, Colonel Bradshaw, who was the first director of training. And then he went on later uh, after two training cycles, and that would have been in um, – in the spring of 1944 to help plan uh, future invasions and in amphibious operations. He, he was quite the, the golden boy in the intelligence uh, within 6th Army G2. So this is an actual uh, color period coda, color photo taken by um, Red Williams, who was the second director of training who followed him from his collection. Okay, next. And here you see is the the map of Ferguson Island where the first ASTC or Alamo Scouts training center was established at the village of Kalo Kalo, about a, a 20 minute uh, boat ride from sixth army headquarters there on good enough Island. That's off the, the, the Eastern tip, the tail of New Guinea. Yeah. All right. And here you see a, a I colorized this photo. It's actually a narrow photo uh, of the first, Scouts Training Center with their sign. And to your left, I'm going to put my glasses on. I believe uh, what we have here is the skill areas and classes of which uh, were offered at the Alamo Scouts Training Center. And you see rubber boat handling, which was a big one, especially in New Guinea, as there were so many um, amphibious type operations. So you see uh, handling, infiltration, uh, in-surf landings, the only two Alamo Scouts who were ever killed while in service of the Alamo Scouts uh, drowned in training in October of 1944, uh, landing, trying, attempting to land in heavy surf. Um, traditionally, uh, or ideally, Alamo Scouts would be dropped off by PT boat 800 yards as far as a mile or mile and a half out. They would paddle in and infiltrate that way. Others by submarine. Um, uh, some, of course, uh, were uh, infilled by uh, ground. So whatever way they could get scouts in, they would, except there were no airborne operations for the Alamo scouts. They did have two trained airborne teams, which were incidentally the teams that conducted later on the Cabanatuan raid. Yeah. And you see that the subheadings, intelligence, collection, uh, scouting, patrolling, survival, communications, and all kinds of weapons. And, and I, I particularly noticed the you know, jungle navigation of you and use of native um, equipment and native, because that's the thing when you get as a Brit mm -hmm. and we look at like the SAS in Malaya and Borneo in the 50s and 60s. This is the kind of things we're putting into practice, the lessons learned in World War II of, 
there had been a habit of the Allies kind of going in there and 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 being all American and British about things and and you know and even the the, the smell you know if you eat, if you if you're going behind the lines if you're eating the same food as the locals are eating you don't smell different those kind of things you you navigate the way the locals navigate use the use their technique this was all common practice in special forces and I agree with you it wasn't a, for, a word a, a term we use in World War Two but later on. This becomes absolutely the bedrock of what special forces were getting. And I know one of the things you get asked a lot is, are the Alamo scouts kind of the, fa the, the forerunners of either the Navy SEALs or the Green Berets? And, you know, I'm going to answer that in my own way, but I'll let you answer kind of like all these organizations are in, 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 in the British forces. We owe a debt to lots of these things like long range desert group, the commandos, and they kind of morph and evolve. And by the 60s and 50s, Fifties, we refine them into these behind the lines of units. But I'm afraid I'm a fear I'm fear of going down too many of my Woody's rabbit holes. So I will keep letting you go, and um, there's we'll go back to the power slide. There was a, a a group photo of the first staff, including some of the men who who later become team leaders. Okay, next. All right, now there. Uh, that's a, a nice photo. They're enjoying what they called torpedo juice. So it, it wasn't all all hell at the in the camp so they would take de the denatured alcohol from the propellant from torpedoes and the doctor of the camp seen in the middle would mix it with uh, different types of fruit juices and they would have a, a nice little uh, spirit to enjoy. And this okay. is typical of the kind of training photos because, you know, they, and by the way, Lance, you must be really pleased when you started your research just how many photos are available because i can think of certain forces of world war ii that were mm -hmm. 10 times the size of lmo scouts of which there were like three photos from the war in existence and you've got a catalog of them and i should point out folks lance has written two brilliant books about lmo scouts the links to his website where you can purchase those pdfs is in the description below so you must have when you say you you know you, you went into this with with very little information you landed on your feet in terms of what material you found. So, I mean, amazing, just amazing imagery. Well, and, and I, I have to give credit um, or credits due. Uh, the National Archives, they, they had a decent amount of photos. This photo here is of a 26-mile practice jungle hike during the first class that was uh, duplicated <laughs> and repeated throughout all of the training cycles. Um, there was a good amount of photographs from that first training, not, not so much after that, but I got the lion's share of photographs from the scouts themselves and from their families. Starting out with, I probably had, now this was one of the original photos, I probably had um, somewhere, somewhere near 75 or so, and now we have over 800 because the families bought into it and opened up those scrapbooks and they had a lot of little photographs and I'm also a photographer, my wife is. And so we were able to, to enlarge and, and really come out with some good photos. This is underwater fire exercise where he's using a 45 caliber machine gun shooting into the water and they, they would yell and the scouts would have to dive between these two ropes and swim underneath. And for a lot of the guys, they said this was the hairiest part of their training. And I can imagine why. Next, okay. uh, calisthenics, which you see everywhere. The man, you see the, the bigger man to the left was actually um, Carl Moyer. He was a brown belt in judo, which was kind of uh, an oddity at that time for someone to be that highly ranked. And he, they, he taught judo at the camps. Next, there you see an example of it, some of the throws and this first group of guys, you can see the first camp, uh, which basically consisted of 44 men selected from uh, Sixth Army units. Most of these men came from the 1st Cavalry Division. And how, how much um, difference do you think it made, Lance, that essentially these guys are training within, broadly speaking, the same conditions they're going to be operating in? Because, you know, that came up in the Kiska show. It's come up in other, other shows I've done about special forces is that, you know, if you're training in Scotland, for example, as some commanders, and then you end up going to North Africa, you've got to you've got to acclimatize the conditions there. It must have been a bit of a bonus that they're in the, the same kind of climate, they're in the same kind of conditions, because 
you know, we all know your body gets used to operating in a certain time, you know, just even the, the time zone, you know, when it gets dark, when it gets light, your body attunes to all that. So that, that was a real benefit that that unit could have that kind of in the theater training in the very terrain they'd be experiencing. Do, do you think that had a, a big uh, factor play in their, in, in their success? Absolutely, especially when you're you're talking at temperatures sometimes over a hundred degrees with high humidity, and 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 the other element there, Paul, is um, getting people used to the to the diseases, yeah, and and the sicknesses and so forth, and building up some kind of immunities and and learning jungle craft, and there's all of that plays into the theater based training, which was which uh, and to add to your point from earlier the scouts had the foresight to use an Australian jungle expert as their primary trainer when it came to jungle craft and jungle foods and, and the such. So, and, and let's be honest, Lance, the Australians have learned a lot of those techniques the hard way, you know, you only yeah. go back to the Kokoda tra track and what they did in, Koko in, in, um, in New Guinea generally, you know, and yes, the Australians again have a little bit of a more understanding of that climate because of, of Australia's own climate, but yeah, and fitness, so key, Lance. When we did shows about the chin dits, we've done shows about, you know, when your fitness starts taking a, a beating, then all the diseases affect you even worse. So these guys, if they're kept in, a, you know, as close to 100% physical fitness as possible, they're in the theatre. They're, they're by this point, now, by 1945, the, the techniques have advanced in terms of how to prepare yourself for jungle warfare. The, the treatment available is better than it was even even probably a year or two earlier, let alone, um, you know, uh, beginning of the war when all of us are going into that theatre just blindly. Um, so, yeah, important stuff there. And language. And we're coming to this slide now. La language is the key uh, success to understanding the, the enemy and what they're doing. So explain a bit about that. Well, in New Guinea, they were they – were they were taught pidgin English. They learned a lot of that, a lot of uh, local dialects, just enough to to basically barter for information. So if, if you traded a native a couple cigarettes, well, he might run up the tree and get you a coconut. Well, you know that coconut's not going to be contaminated. Um, and then, then you might deal with him a little bit and say, hey, any Japanese? Oh, okay. Then it give you some intel because the, the Japanese were doing the same thing. So there was really a little bit of a, a of a civil action point to this too that you know you had to interact with the natives well, and what better way is to be able to speak a little bit of their their language and to communicate them with them on some level. So you see here a Japanese phrase book, uh, Tagalog, which is spoken in uh, in the upper regions of the Philippines, and uh, Pidgin English, whatever they could they could pick up. They did. It's it's called it was called Hearts and Minds when the SAS went yeah. to places like Borneo. They called it Hearts and Minds. Then you know if you're going in there and you speak a bit of the local people's language, it, it gains trust. I mean, I ridiculously I tell that to Americans when they come to Normandy is when you go into a restaurant, just say bonjour. You'll be amazed how much sure. more of a welcome you get just by using the local hello, mm -hmm. and then you get your dinner. Merci. It just opens up doors. People puts people at ease. Okay, that's a trivial example to use, but it makes absolutely perfect sense. Then let's go back to the needs of the Alamo Scout. It's scouting, it's reconnaissance, it's gathering information. And a lot of the information is going to come from people who are indigenous to the places you're going. And if they if they feel they can trust you slightly more than they trust the Japanese, win, win. You get the information, the army gets its knowledge, everybody wins. Exactly. Here you see an example of uh, advanced first aid that uh, was taught there in the jungle. Uh, and, and I might add, too, these were Kruger's baby. He, they were under the direct control or command of Kruger, and he, he provided everything to them. Every, anything they wanted, he would get for them. They had uh, cemented floors and screened in uh, mess halls and the, the best that the Army supply system could get them, he got. So he, he understood he wanted to make them special, and he wanted that mentality in those men going in. You'll see here, uh, this was more, I think, uh, of the, the officers having fun in a rubber boat, but it, it gives you an idea of, of the, the surf there in, in New Guinea. I think it also, these photos also get across a good esprit de corps and unit pride mm -hmm. and, 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 
and and joy behind it. Um, and in that photo there, you know, I, I think it's a pertinent time to mention one of the myths about the Alamo Scouts. Because I, I, when I do prep for these shows, I try and look at good sources, but I also try and look at shit sources because I try and find out what people might believe that's wrong. And one of the things is that all the Alamo Scouts were Native Americans and foreigners. Let, let's kind of talk about that one there. What's the actual makeup of the Alamo Scouts, roughly speaking? Okay. Um, well, let's start with this. Uh, while we're at this, how were the Alamo Scouts, how were men obtained? First yeah. and foremost, uh, letters were sent out by Kruger, by 6th Army, to each of the divisions and then filtered on down saying we need X number of men, volunteers. So at the company level, regimental, then down, they would ask for the volunteers. They would accumulate about 100 men, and then they would be interviewed. And a representative from the scouts, uh, Colonel Bradshaw, in the first couple of classes, would go in, and he would have, and this is a wonderful test, he would have a tray with, say, maybe 20 items or more sitting on that tray, a comb, a cigarette lighter, something odd, um, you know, piece of a sandwich, you name it. And then he would conduct the interview. Why do you want to be in, the, in this unit? Well, I want to kill Japanese. Well, he was already eliminated then. They didn't want people who wanted to kill Japanese. And then he would say, well, dismiss. They would get to the door and he'd have the, the soldier turn around and, and he would have the tray covered. Please list for me the items on that tray. Well, if you didn't get most all of them, you weren't very observant. He wanted observant people. It was a wonderful little test. Well, to, to look at this photo, you see some uh, Native Americans in there. Actually, one, two, three, four five Native Americans in this particular training uh, shot. They had the best visual memory of any of the Alamo Scouts, given, given their in, environment, and their upbringing, and, and cultural uh, I don't know what traditions, the really. Yeah. yeah, I mean, it's you, you, you recognize where you're at visually by landmarks and, and, and trees or rocks and the Native Americans basically blew everyone away in that area. And that's why they were so successful and so uh, cherished among the Alamo Scouts. So, but, what, this, but this is interesting because it's like, it's like looking for people who had kind of, you know, when we're looking for people to break the Enigma codes, you're looking uh -huh. at people who have the way their brains work is differently because the thrust of this, when we, when we talk before going live is that we have an image that isn't necessarily correct of special forces being going in and blowing things up all the time. That's how the movies always do, whether it's the forties, the fifties or present day, it's going in, blowing things up. And, and the point about good recon is good reconnaissance is the enemy shouldn't know you've been there at all. That's it's, it's about stealth. And I, I'm glad you said about this idea of weeding out the guys who say they want to kill the Japanese. Now in certain units, that would be an advantage. It depends what yeah. you're trying to do with these people. But in this particular situation, it's, it's about gaining information. It's about giving your greater force an edge by having more information about the enemy than they have about you. That's kind of fundamentally it, isn't it, Lance, I guess? Yes, absolutely. And, and to go to the next step, Paul, is once these, these volunteers were identified and, and screened at, at the regimental level, or they, they, were, they would receive orders to come to the scouts on temporary duty. The first night, they were all put into a tent, and they were observed. They were, there were checkers, chess, cards, the loudmouths and the blowhards and the braggarts. They were gone the next morning before everybody got up. They were already weeded out. Kruger and, and his staff, they did not want the loud people. They wanted guys who could work together as a team. People who knew their role was to be quiet, to be yeah. silent, to be stealthy, and, and and leave. Check your ego at the door, and those are the guys that began training. And this, in many ways, is the antithesis of what certain 
airborne, you know, airborne units, for example. And I got lots of airborne fr veteran friends from World War II and beyond. And it's all about thinking you're the best, believing you're the best, and a certain amount of kind of bragging it up. And that's fine. That's absolutely essential to what the airborne are doing and that belief and 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 overconfidence almost and, sure. and bolshiness the airborne have and of 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 almost arrogance. But mm -hmm. this isn't what we're talking about here. This is a different type of operation. I'm glad you're really covering this because when we get to the, the the raid later on, which of course we will, all this context, all this background about what these people did, is 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 integral to understanding how seamlessly that operation will flow when we when we get to that point. And here you'll see a typical team, which which would be about six to seven men. They were formed into teams six to seven men with a junior officer, a lieutenant leading, and he, he would have uh, ideally one or two NCOs. And, you know, we're talking 21 to 23-year-old team leaders. And, and, and what's really unique, and we'll get to this ballot here in just a minute, uh, of how the scouts selected their men and their team leaders. Now, you see here, based on your your personal observations, who would you choose to, to serve with or go into battle with or go on a mission with? And everyone would put down their first, second, third choice and why? And also they, in another ballot, they the enlisted men would vote with whom they would like to be led by of the officers on a dangerous mission. So, in a way, the criterion for selecting the Alamo Scouts was based on, number one, first and foremost and always, the needs of the Army. And number two, any, any uh, upcoming operations that they would have manpower needs for. And three, this silent ballot by their peers, which really had not been used in American type of, uh, of armies since the Civil War. When, when a lot of soldiers elected their town mayor or the richest guy in town and gave him a, a title of colonel, and then most of them died in a battle because they had no military experience. <laughs> well, these guys trained for six weeks with these people, and, and, and they switched up teams, they rotated leaders, and, and looked for good compositions of men. And, and when you sent me this PowerPoint, Lance, this was the slide I spent ages looking at going, wow, that is, I've never seen anything like that, where there's almost, well, it's democracy in action, it's trust, it's based, yeah, and, you know, because everybody who knows a veteran from World War II knows that guy who got that story about that, that officer or sergeant that was thrust upon them, that was useless, that they yeah. hated, that... And, and that you have to overcome that. You have to overcome that by that guy either being promoted out of the way or killed or he gets booted out, whatever it would be. If you yourself are part of the selection process for the rank structure around you, it's a really, really amazing foundation, I would think, for, for getting the job done. And, and I, would, I would venture to say it's pretty much unique with regards to World War II. Well, sure. And, and these men understood that if you're 500 miles behind enemy lines as they were at times on an island you know you better trust the man to your left and to your right and 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 to your six and to your 12. yeah amazing stuff mm -hmm. there is a, a a colorized photo of sumner team and he was uh on the back row far left colonel sumner is the man that i reached out to who was the head of the Alamo Scouts Association at the time and and really who set me on my way by giving me a roster. He said, Merry Christmas, and gave me the roster of all the surviving scouts. So he is the man really responsible for releasing this information. And I don't want to go down another rabbit hole, but hey, I'm going to enjoy this show. I don't care how long it goes on. I'm guessing, Lance, when you first made contact with these indiv individuals, because they had this bond of selecting their own people, you as an outsider probably had to leap through a hoop, a few hoops of your own to, to earn their trust. You know, I know, I know your ex-services yourself. You've, you know, you've been there and done it to a certain extent, so you have that legitimacy going for you as well. But um, I'm, I'm, I'm guessing that they are, they were fairly closed ranks as, a, as an association at that time. 
Yes, and, and it, it was amazingly so. I mean, they followed orders well. One scout told me, he said, at the end of the war, we were told to, to go home, shut up, and not say anything about what you did. And he said, I maintained that position for, for 60 years. And they did. I, I mean, it. Colonel Sumner, I had to gain his trust through many phone calls. And, and he's probably thinking, doesn't this guy know anything? But I wouldn't give up. And to be honest with you, a number of, of well-known authors, American military authors, had approached him to write a book on the scouts and they never got their photos back. Mm. So a lot of the scouts were really kind of reluctant to, to come forth and, and give up things. The, those photos that you re, you referenced without Bob's okay. And after a while I gained Bob's uh, confidence because he saw I wasn't going to quit. And he said, uh, I remember him saying clearly because he got tired, I think, of dealing with me. He just said, uh, Lance, young man, Merry Christmas. I'm going to send you the roster, but it does not leave your hands. It does not go to anyone because the patch collectors are hot and heavy on the trail. Mm. So there's mm. the story of how I got the names, to the list of the Alamo Scouts. Brilliant stuff. In formation for graduation ceremony of the fourth class. Okay, and here you see a, a pretty pretty well well published photo of five Af or Native Americans with Douglas MacArthur there in New Guinea. And I believe left to right, you have uh, that's an Alamo scout. Um, I know the scout next to to MacArthur is uh, Byron Tissen Jenny. He was uh, an Alamo scout from the first class. So I. Uh, Larry Doton, I believe, is to the far right. There are at least three of these men uh, went through Alamo Scouts training. And, and the elephant in the room, which we'll get out of the way now, is what did they think of MacArthur? And try, try and let's not go into half an hour about that because oh, sure. yeah, MacArthur is MacArthur, and I'm going to be doing a whole show about MacArthur at one point. But, you know, <laughs> some people loved him, some people didn't love him. It's the whole Patton Montgomery thing. So in terms of the Alamo Scouts and, in, and Kruger himself, how, how did they perceive MacArthur. Okay. Um, and I will say at this, at this juncture, um, some of them had an opportunity to serve as an escort with him. Galen Kittleson being one of them. And he rode from, uh, in a boat, uh, around Bataan. And I said, did he speak to you, Galen? And he said, he didn't speak to anybody under the rank of Colonel, yeah. <laughs> but they admired his brilliance. They knew that, but the scouts really favored Kruger over MacArthur because, well, they, he was their guy. He gave them everything they wanted and, and uh, um, they were very loyal in that respect. And to be I, fair to MacArthur, he's operating at a much higher level of yeah. many, many things to think about. And I'm not yeah. a MacArthur fan, but, you know, he's not going to have time to form an intimate relationship with, you know, no. 150 guys on an island somewhere, is he? You know, he's operating no. at, at that fleet and army size. So, you know, it's Alamo scout John Geiger was on Leyte when MacArthur arrived. He was watching the whole ceremony as MacArthur came and he said there was a Japanese sniper firing off rounds. And he said, I will give MacArthur this. People were ducking and he just stood there. He just like, like he was impervious to, to getting shot. And, and I'd heard that before in, in other accounts during World War I and, and later. Yeah, we've heard that about Patton. We've heard that about it. It's yeah. one of those that seems to go hand in hand with people like that is they have this belief in their own <laughs> shield of importance or something. Yeah. Anyway, we'll move on from that. Now, th this is a great thing because this reminds me of, you know, the, the jump the jump certificates that I've seen mm -hmm. many times of. And, and the, the fact that they get a certificate to create on a competing competing of training, I think is amazing. Again, this is all part of a spree de corps. It's part of a, a sending out a message of accomplishment and that, you, and that you've, you've achieved something. So therefore you can't let people down. And I think it's, I think it's a, a real, a real, I was amazed there was a certificate, frankly. I, oh I, yes. And you see there, this particular one, June 22nd, uh, 44, this is from the third training class, and it's William Blaze. Well, his son, Russ Blaze, 
is the executive director of the Alamo Scouts Historical Foundation and a dear friend. And a and, he's, of, and he's watching and, and 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 giving us lots of extra information on the on the sidebar there. So uh, welcome to the show, Russ, and thank you for your contributions on the sidebar. We are we are loving it tonight. Um, he's a, Russ is an outstanding graphic artist, and he has really done a lot of the work with with the photos and. And we've taken a lot of research trips, and he has really been a champion of keeping this unit alive in the pursuit of of continued historical uh, discovery. Another colorized or not actual color photo, Hotel Alamo, they used to call it. And <laughs> you can see why. Yeah. All right. And there, visually, team composition. You see junior officer, one NCO, usually five to six men. 138 men retained, um, over 500 trained, six to seven man teams, and 12 operational teams, and considered by many the Army's first uh, long range surveillance unit. And here is a uh, is a still taken from a film clip that I discovered in the National Archives that's misnamed. So I believe it may be some of the only footage of the Alamo Scouts but it was taken during a recreation of the first mission on Los Negros Island in the Admiralties. And that would be McGowan team in June of 1944, recreating a mission. That is John McGowan performed the first, led the first operational Alamo Scouts mission on 29 February of 44 on Los Negros Island. So let's talk about these the operations that they do. Well, I mean, okay. I, I'm, 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 you get to it when you in your own good time, Lance, because I'm enjoying every minute of it. But what, what, get to it when you want to get to it. Basically, I'm just all excited now. <laughs> okay. Well, you see here, this is McGowan team receiving the Silver Star following this first mission, and and I have to talk about the first mission a little bit because the success of this team infiltrating by uh, PBY, then rowing ashore under the eyes of the Japanese, they were they were seen, and they thought they'd have to be crazy to be coming onto this island. Well, they did, and they they conducted a reconnaissance. There was an airfield there, and actually the Japanese patrols were within ten feet or less of the scouts, and they they were lying in the grass, camouflaged, and the, the Japanese patrol was walking by them. They got the information out that it wasn't as um, defended as Sixth Army planners believed. MacArthur was lying in wait with the with the task force, and he changed the reconnaissance in force to a full scale invasion with the First Cavalry Division. Uh, had a successful landing there on Los Negros and the capture of Mamote Airstrip. And incidentally, I will say uh, they. A first cab soldier was given the Distinguished Service Cross for being the first soldier on landing on Las Negras. It wasn't. It was an Alamo scout named Gomez from, uh, from McGowan's team. And he was the first soldier to land on Las Negros Island. And then immediately this, this validated the concept of the Alamo scouts. And everybody said, hey, the job they did, that was fantastic. So then it, it really gave them some, uh, to use the vernacular modern day, some street cred or jungle cred, if you will. Yeah. Uh, and that, and that's interesting because, you know, for example, we did Operation Jaywick a couple of weeks ago. They ended up that mission had to be kept hush hush because it, it's a strange thing. You're, being covert and secret and, 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 and mysterious means you don't want the enemy to know what you're doing. But there's also a publicity to kind of telling other people that this is what we can do now. And and to instill this kind of sense that the Sixth Army is on top of things and has got this advantage over other people. And and it's it's a fascinating kind of chess game is of, of, of the army having this force and kind of letting the, the public kind of know they've got this force, but not quite the complete purpose of it. But, you know, because, you know, this is, and this is in, still in that period of the war where things are going our way, but th there's still some uncertainty here and there. And we need, you know, the public need good news. The army need good news. The, everybody needs good news. And little missions like that, that become very, very important, that have an, uh, a, 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 an effect 
down the line, the greater than the, the expenditure, are very good for PR. They're very good for a feel-good factor, I think. And most people back home didn't know where New Guinea. They had no idea no. where New Guinea was at. And I don't, I'm not sure I did when I started research on these guys, but <laughs> I'm getting better and better. But yeah, my Pacific <laughs> geography is still not very good. Yeah. This is another, another amazing photo. Well, this was taken one of those stills from that, that movie clip and, and Russ did a real good job of tightening that up and, and just making it a fabulous, fabulous photograph. But those are actually members of McGowan team, uh, as you see with the M1 carbine. All right, now, I, I mentioned earlier that Kruger pretty much gave the scouts whatever they wanted. Well, this is called the Kruger card here. And he gave them this card and basically you could have about whatever you wanted. You want to, you want a deuce and a half, get it. You want to bump somebody on a flight, it's yours. Whatever they needed, they got. By the And the team leaders would carry this card. And you know this particular card here, uh, Irvin Ray, he started out as the youngest Alamo scout at 19 years of age and later became a major general in the Air Force. Next one. Wow. Now, this here it was a, a multi-service team that went to uh, Sanzapur, now, which is clear at the at the western edge of the Vogelkop or the bird's head of New Guinea to scout out areas, landing areas, and areas for potential uh, um, airfields. So the Alamo scouts, you'll see in the back row that from left to right, you have three members there with some some AIB guys in the back and another scout. And then you had uh, William Chance um, from Fifth Air Force. In the very middle there on the bottom row, you had George Thompson. Tommy Thompson was just an outstanding uh, team leader from the first class. And these are on the front row, uh, Sixth Army elements and Fifth Air Force elements, uh, all involved engineers trying to do the down and dirty. And they went by submarine, the SS-47 uh, submarine on the top secret mission, two-week mission to scout out. So it was, it was a pretty nice little way of doing things. Uh, here you, you see a, another joint mission with some uh, Nephis soldiers from the Dutch. Um, they went to Salababoe Island and the Talud group to do a snatch and grab. Now you see the little guy here in the with the pith helmet in the front? Well, he was the prisoner. He was the only guy they could catch. And this is when they were considering whether or not to uh, land on Formosa. And so they were testing out some of the, the uh, Japanese defenses in this island group south of Formosa. So you can see that quite a long mission from a PT base in, in uh, Gilbink Bay or Windy Island all the way up to that group. So um, big tall guy in the back is uh, Bob Shuloff from Burlington, Iowa. Uh, just so tell, middle tell kid. Bit, <laughs> Sorry, tell me a little bit. When, when these missions are being planned yeah, and they're, and they're getting this instructions to get intel, how, how many – steps are there in the chain or are they kind of dealing with the general himself and his own team because we all know how the army works with its departments and g2s and g3s and s1s and s2s and, you know it seems to me <laughs> if you're going to use this force that you've got to kind of bypass some of the channels so that this is it's not just getting stuck in all the all the paperwork of, of an army so I, how mm -hmm. how how would they briefed on what to get and what to and and the info because they would be given intelligence themselves they'd be given aerial photos what's sure. it hide information so how did that kind of chain of command work well normally you know kruger of, of course is working with horton horton v white who was his g2 of sixth army um i'm sure they met every day and whatever the the intelligence situation was what you needed, then he would be tasked. And then White would either reach out directly to, at, to the ASTC, to the commander and say, hey, I need two teams immediately. And they would either be deployed to wherever they were, well, or they needed. But later, 
the scouts were establishing one or two teams on a on a Navy PT base, Mios Windy in, in Gilvink Bay, nor in the northern part of New Guinea. So they had a couple teams of scouts ready to go at a moment's notice. So when a mission would come down, the Navy would say, "Hey, here's your ride. Get on. We're supposed to take you to here." And and they would drop the scouts off, and then a couple of three days later, or a day later, or a week later, whatever the mission called for, uh, that PT boat or another one, or another two or three would come back, and they would they would signal and have a prearranged pickup point, and they would row out to the to the PT boat, and off they went back home. Then they would type up a mission report, be debriefed, and. And the next team would be the next man out. I mean, this is much more like the modern idea way we think about Delta Force and SAS of these teams sitting on standby and the SEALs, I guess, 24 mm-hmm. hours a day, seven days a week. So that when that 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 emergency happens and, and there's there's like a like a fire department, there's blue blue team and red team. They're there. Anyone that is going to do this stuff. And. It seems that this is, to me, is is my understanding of special forces in the ETO. This is really, really efficient. This is really cutting edge. And I'm wondering why other armies and other uh, uh, forces around the world didn't have this kind of resource. Because it seems to me absolutely blisteringly perfect at what it does and the setup just just outstanding. I'm, I'm, as I said, I'm going to say, say it again. I'm thoroughly enjoying this presentation, every second of it. Well, Paul, I think this speaks to to the brilliance of Frederick Bradshaw. The director of training. I mean, he he was a very sharp individual, and he knew what was required. and And I think he, like a meticulous attorney, he was. You know, he he examined all the different the needs and what are the capabilities and you know what are the logistics. And I I think he saw on a broader way and in, in a broader way and had a broader vision. Mm. Of, of what the scouts needed to be than, than a lot of the the commanders at the time who who were perhaps burdened by the immediacy of the mission. Yeah. So what there's, the, there's conversations in the sidebar from Russ and others about the fact these teams have their own autonomy. They can say no to a mission. They absolutely. can and and that's you know I'm coming I come from the the, the understanding of the British Army. You can never say no to a mission, no matter how <laughs> right. stupid it is. If they say you've got to go and buy so and so and glider and get out by donkey, if that's what the army tells you to do, that's what mm-hmm. you do it. And the fact that this this force has the ability to go, no, it's not, it's not the, it's not right for us. That's that's incredible, isn't it? Did, did well, they ever say no, by the way, or was it just an option they never had to use? Well, there was a mission to uh, to capture General Adachi, and it was it was what well, would have really been a dangerous mission, and the team leaders were considering whether to to nix it, and they said, no, we're, we're going to go ahead with it. Well, Kruger himself nixed the mission. He says, I don't want to lose any of my guys. It's not worth it. So when you have a man at the top and men at the top who say, well, you know what? These guys are a valuable asset, and this one mission is not life or death, and it's not going to win the war. I think the men themselves – see that, hey, somebody really cares about it. It's like having a boss in, in your everyday job who is really concerned about your well-being. Well, you mm. want to perform for that boss. Yeah, it, it's creating a, an, a, an unbreakable trust, I yeah. see. That, and, you know, that he's got your back, but that means when you are sent in, you have to have his back as well. It, it works two ways, yes. that, you know, yes. he's going to send you on the missions that he really thinks is important. And when he does, you damn well do your very best to work for it and, and to get it done. So, yeah, I'm, I'm absolutely loving this. So, and these color images are just outstanding. So what are we looking at here, Lance? Um, th- this would be uh, Bradshaw here to the left and um, the doctor, Dr. Canfield, who died in 1970, I believe, from Pennsylvania. He became a preeminent uh, doctor of tropical diseases. Then the, the third man was the third director of training and um, not sure who the fourth man, but Howard or Homer Williams, the second director, he is kneeling. So uh, you see that they have these Japanese flags. Well, these particular officers did not get them. 
they were brought back from the scouts on missions, which led which led me to a a very good story about them. They had the best food in many ways because they had the best supply officer, Mayo Stunts. God bless him. He, he, after the war, he became a CIA station chief. He was a, an author, uh, but he was a scrounger extraordinaire. And he would take these war souvenirs out to the Navy, have guys take um, uh, little little trips out to the boats and trade for ice cream and refrigerators and whiskey and you name it, sides of beef, uh, fresh eggs, fruit, whatever. And the scouts were so well fed. I mean, everybody ate powdered eggs in that theater. Well, the scouts were eating fresh eggs because of Mayo stunts. And, and, and they, the scouts, and I will say this, they even had a little factory operation going on later on when they got in the Philippines, they would take white, parachute linen, cut it up, and then they had a, a little a little mold, and then they'd take chicken blood and put it on there to make the Japanese flag, and they'd take them out to the Navy and trade for whiskey and all kinds of good things. So uh, the scouts, uh, Tom Roundsville told me, he said, we have one of the best flag-making operations in the Pacific Theater <laughs> to include the Japanese. <laughs> that reminds me of a story. I'm going to go down a rabbit hole now. I met a, a, a veteran years ago of, of, of the late war in Germany, and he was saying how uh, his particular unit captured a Nazi flag factory. <laughs> so they all came back with 60 each. Oh, and, he did that and, and then went round to everyone. Said, I've, I've got one souvenir. Of course, they had a sack <laughs> load of And they kept saying, saying they're selling their last Nazi flag. But of course, <laughs> there was 10 more in the duffel bag. And you think you have to admire that, that, that kind of enterprise. That to me is coming out of the war. You've lost your friends, but you're coming out financially on top. That's good. That's a good, that's good use of resources. And that's the good stuff about when we look at history, when we, we get past the X's and the O's and, and, and all of that, th there's also the, that always that human element. Absolutely. With it's humor. Of understanding it. Yeah. I mean, it's just without, without, without what you're bringing about this, the, the color to this unit, it just becomes about mission dates sure. and mission sizes and results. And it just becomes, it just becomes graphs. And uh, that's not what we're talking about. And you see a signed flag there. Most of these flags, they were given to soldiers Japanese soldiers before they left and signed most of the the names are just well wishers people they worked with people who lived in their village wishing them good luck yeah now you can see here is the is the operational chart uh, of the Alamo Scouts and you see the top is the Army G2 well this particular chart really is effective of as of 1945 and and I'm going to direct your attention here to the right, the special intelligence subsection. Now, after January of 45, uh, Frank Rawali was in charge of that special subsection. And you see there's a diagonal line showing supply to the Alamo Scouts Training Center. Well, and then it filters on down to scout teams in the field and guerrilla operations. Well, on Luzon especially, this is when the scouts really began taking on a, a more of a of a, a, a la special forces internal defense slash training indigenous forces supplying them coordinating them that sort of thing and, and it they really became uh, quite successful at it especially taking into account the age 21 to 23 24 years of old of age uh, uh, equipping thousand man guerrilla units. And, th and this is clearly a testament to their successes. They, they've, they've, they've done what they said they would, do, they would do. They've done it very well. They've got a brilliant reputation. They've got clearly brilliant esprit de corps. And yeah, no, no doubt. Of course, the army is always watching in these situations. Of course, yeah. if you do well, you just get more, more jobs to do. That's that's how, <laughs> that's how life works, isn't it? Yes, it is. Okay, now if you go back, Paul, just one slide yeah, right, yeah. for on that. You see here in Luzon, uh, missions up one to 72 days. Well, prior to that, when you look in New Guinea, uh, the missions generally two to three days. Well, partly because of the isolation being on an island, you want to get your information and get them off there. So a lot of times it was just an overnight stay. When you got to Leyte, 
in 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 October of '44, the missions became a little bit longer, up to you know a couple of weeks. But really, it, it was it, it was on Luzon where the scouts did their best work, and they they were so extensively supported by the guerrillas, and that really makes a difference when that when that fifth column <laughs> is there when there's, they're supporting you when they're they're giving you water. A lot of times the scouts went out on on a mission. That 72 mission day mission or 67 day mission actually that uh, Bill Nellis went on. He said all we went out on was a uh, a bag of peanuts, uh, a, a bottle of benzedrine, and and luck. He said we were fed along the way by the the Filipino guerrillas. And he said they were they were vital to our success. Picture of the uh, one of the photos of the Bataan Death March, in which about approximately 70,000 U.S. and Filipino troops were uh, uh, imprisoned. And, and this is all setting us up, of course, yes. the, the main thrust of the of the of the, of the presentation. And uh, yeah, and I and I also want to, I know we, we will cover this is that the Allies don't have a perfect record in World War II of using local resistance units no. to their best advantage. If anything, it's the other way around. If you could, you could name all the theaters operations and there's kind of, I think, built in at the very top, a distrust of anybody, anybody foreign, essentially, I think is where it goes. And, and I, you know, it's, it's, it's a world we still live in today to some extent. And, and the fact the Alamo scouts have paved the way by, creating a bond with with that I mean they're they're perfectly well regarded by the army but they're also making these inroads with with these unconventional forces that are already in the theater and that to me is absolutely integral to their success mm -hmm. yeah just another Batan death march photo you see there uh these drawings were actually uh, many of them were hidden in a bottle and buried and dug up after the raid a few days, which incidentally, most people don't know this. It was an Alamo scout, Jack Dove, who went back with the 6th Army Intelligence Officer and dug up a lot of these documents that were later used. Actually, 1,355 death notices written on the back of milk can labels, which were used in the trial of, of General Hama. Or the, so, so let's talk about what, what, when this camp was set up in Luzon and why it was set up and what just the kind of potted version of its history because it's people have been moved in and out of that camp and uh, so give us a bit of an idea about what its history had been prior to early 1945. Okay when when the American forces were surrendered on April 9th of 42 which is incidentally the uh, the Lee's surrender to Grant in the American Civil War it was it was the largest surrender of U.S. forces. Well what are you going to do with all these forces? Well, the, the Japanese didn't expect, they didn't expect a third of what they got. To the Japanese mindset, well, you, you kill yourself instead of, of surrendering. They couldn't believe it. So all of a sudden, they, they have 60-some thousand, 70,000 people. Well, they, they had to march them to a number of camps. Well, there happened to be this one camp, um, among many, at, uh, it was Pangatian was the actual camp, which was um, east of Cabana Tuan City. So many of the, the death march survivors ended up into this camp and others uh, moving in and out. Some, some went to Japan on hell ships to work in coal mines and, and other things. And, you know, many died. Um, you know, uh, actually, it's been estimated a couple thousand died here at Cabana Tuan in this particular camp. And, you got, and people have to understand too, that you mentioned it earlier, the heat up near 120 degrees and you have all these tropical diseases and no medicines and, and squalid conditions and, and approximately 1000 calories a day. Whereas as you know, um, prisoners at, at Auschwitz and, and other uh, death camps were the Germans gave them 800 calories a day or less with, with the design of working them, them to death after yeah. so long. So I think the Japanese were kind of in, in that mindset as well. Yeah. 
and and there's two things going on, isn't it? There's the there's the gradual deterioration of the the men's health. There's the gradual deterioration of the Japanese ability to feed people in these camps because yeah. they're losing the war by now. And then you combine that with this. And the, the the analogy I'm going to use is that is the most dangerous animal is the is the fatally wounded animal. The Japanese army that is now a fatally wounded beast. It's yeah. not going to win the war, but there's nothing more dangerous than a fatally wounded beast and this is this is this fear that's happening around the pacific of this final act of the japanese massacring people and it's you you read about this in in, in singapore in shangi then anywhere where allies were being held prisoner there's this fear as we get into 45 of the japanese killing everybody within their cap, uh, prisons rather than allowing them to be liberated by the enemy which you know we're not going to go into the moral reasons behind that and we have got sarah kovner's sure. show coming up later this month where who's done a work into the japanese prisoner war camp system but the point is things are all coming to a head as we get into that winter of 1944-45 as with the very successes the allies are gaining militarily there are these concerns about what's happened to these people who let's be honest lance there's a feeling amongst some in the army that the army had abandoned these people years earlier. So there's a bit of guilt playing here, and deservedly so, this guilt, sure. I think, because, you know, me as a, from East Anglia in Britain, a lot of my people from counties near me stepped off the boats in Singapore to immediate captivity. They didn't yeah. even get a chance to, you know, take their, 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 undo their rifles and slings and go into combat, straight into captivity. So they were probably let down by their, by their governments, their leaders. So I just want to get for people who, the context of where we are getting to by this point now, and then we can bring it back to the raid itself. But I wanted people to be clear of what's been going on with the Japanese military at this point in the war. Okay. And, and to give you a, a, a real down and dirty, I mean, the war is still going on in New Guinea, pretty much left to left to the, to the Australians, so to speak. We're moving up in October. We moved into Leyte. Uh, we got guerrilla forces on Mindanao. We're, we're making our way up, the central Philippines to Luzon, which is the prize. That yeah. is the largest of the Philippine islands. Well, you mentioned the, the battling bastards of Bastogne <laughs> or not. That's, that's actually, I'm sorry, that's the Eastern the theater. But to your point, yes, the, the people, they did feel like they were abandoned. Yeah. And to go step one, one step back, Sixth Army had been receiving reports in June of 44 about the camp. So intelligence was getting out there. So the problem was we, we didn't have the conventional forces to do anything about it. Now, Volkman had a 10,000-man army, a guerrilla army in northern Luzon, but he, he didn't dare come out in the central plains and, and challenge the Japanese and try to take over a camp, not without any type of logistic support. So that was really a, a, a no brainer there. So they had to wait. Well, as we get closer to January of 45, the Japanese feel the ring tightening. So what do they do? Hey, we have to get rid of what's of what we've done. We know it's wrong. So what do they do at Palawan at a camp there, an airfield? They take 150 American POWs and they, under the guise of an air attack, have them get into air raid shelters pour gasoline on them and immolate them. So fortunately, 11 of those men crawled out the back in, in garbage heaps and managed to, to escape and swim to other nearby islands and, and they were helped and word got back. Well, when we landed on Luzon on 9 January of 45, the immediate concern was what are they going to do to these 500 some prisoners at Cabana Tuan and, and Bilibad and, and Los Banos and there, what are they, what's going to happen? So Kruger had been getting a lot of uh, hit of reports, many of them from Robert Lapham, who was uh, actually a stay behind a local or Luzon area a guerrilla leader, American, and finally he convinced Kruger on January twenty sixth that. We have to do something. These, they're going to kill him. And Kruger finally consented. So, okay, let's draw it up. So on, on uh, basically 26 January, they, they met 
and they said, let's let's make this happen. So, uh, and Kruger put Colonel White, his G2, in charge and said, uh, come up with a plan. The, the next day, um, early in the morning at, at Gimba, they're, the Rangers and the Scouts and Lapham and G2, they're all meeting and say, okay, what are we going to do? Two o'clock in that afternoon, the Scouts, they're traveling by LPC, which is American acronym for Leather Personnel Carrier. They're off on the trail heading to the area. So that's yeah. how quick it happened. They, they actually, according to Andy Smith, um, they had about two hours prep time. And, and and the weird thing is, it's not. It is a military operation, but it's not. It's weird, kind of, kind of trying to break down its priority because when you're talking about an invasion of Luzon, there's eliminating the Japanese army is concern number one. Mm -hmm. This is a concern, but it can't come higher than number one because even it doesn't mean that no one cares. It's just that it's a. It's you're having to fit this into an operation at a higher level. And this is where it gets really, really interesting that this is going in parallel. Because the, yeah, the American army is moving in force elsewhere, but this is a separate thing into the same place. But it's a rescue mission, isn't it? And so, mm -hmm. uh, and, and you know, you wanted to make it clear before we started this that you know you're the Alamo Scouts expert. Uh, if, if anyone wants to come on one day and do a Sixth Rangers show, we can do that at some point there. And Sixth Rangers provide the muscle for this operation. But you know, the point you're making, and we're, we're going to get to, is the the local intel, the lo the actual. The, the success of this comes from the Alamo Scouts and their cooperation with the Filipino guerrillas. And that's that's the thrust of where you're going to be taking us on this. And and by the way, folks, if you haven't already, I watched it this afternoon. There is, and Lance will be mentioning this later on, there is the 2005 movie with Benjamin Bratt and James Franco, the, the great raid that covers this. Uh, watch this show first, then you can watch the movie and realize that the movie is okay, but it's, you know, it's, it's a movie. But it, it will give you a bit of a visual idea of what was going on this and you know like we always say about movies don't don't treat them as documentaries they're movies but it does give you a bit of a visual idea of the of the of the basic kind of the basicness of the the, the essential thrust of the mission i think is covered if if the details get a little bit um muddled anyway yeah back, back <laughs> to you Lance. sure and, and to piggyback on what you said i sat next i sat with the alamo scouts when we previewed the movie in kansas city in 2005 and for the most part the military aspect of it was pretty pretty much spot on except they had to use a they couldn't find a p61 airplane they had to use a little hollywood trickery to to convince the audience that was what it was and and the, the love interest really didn't fit in. But besides that, really, it was pretty true to the events uh, yeah. of, of the It's operation. pretty simple. Take out the love interest, put in the Alamo Scouts. To me, that pretty much sorts sorted out perfectly. You know, that's it. Take out the love, put in the Alamo Scouts. Boom. That's it. That would be that's what I'll do if I get asked to do the remake. <laughs> <laughs> Very good. So you, you see here, um, what happened is once the scouts took off. And, and the plan was made. They were to hook up with Eduardo, Captain Eduardo Joson, and and obtain a couple guides. And then they were going to make a 24 mile march through enemy territory, a forced march. And they left it at, at 1900 hours, which is five o'clock on uh, the 27th. And as I said, they had a near near 30 mile march actually, um, <laughs> and. What they're doing, they're 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 crossing like the Rizal Highway. Uh, there's Japanese uh, trucks coming by. You know, they're, they're they're dodging them. They're hiding in the weeds. You know, they're, they're evading patrols. This sort of thing. And the the sheer it, if you've ever walked thirty miles, and I have, and I'll tell you what, it's not easy. Hmm. The stress involved. Yeah, I mean, just walking thirty miles. Not, uh, not added to the fact if somebody catches you, they're going to kill you yeah. on the spot or torture you first. <laughs> and the and the weight and the responsibility of the mission that they're conducting, and, and the intricacies of having all of anywhere from two to four hours of planning. So there's there are a lot of little moving parts here. So by the 28th of January of 45, the scouts uh, arrived at Balancari which is a little, little village uh, north and 
on north end, I guess, kind of, uh, I don't know if it's on your map here. You see the camp there. It, it would be it would be north of that, just right, a couple okay. miles. They meet uh, Juan Pajota, who is the overall uh, guerrilla leader. He had about uh, 100 and, or 250-ish, uh, 90 armed, I think 60 unarmed uh, men at his disposal. And so the scouts took a little rest. The guerrillas were sent to the camp at Cabana Tuan, where approximately 520 prisoners were being held. At, at that same time, at, at 0500 in the morning, the, the Rangers begin their march under uh, Colonel Musi to Gimba. That's where their staging point, where they're going to they're gonna begin their walk. Now, Musi was a, like a hard-charging uh, military West Point graduate, class of 33, I believe. Uh, had swagger stick and a little the little Errol Flynn mustache and <laughs> quite uh, well pro well portrayed I believe by Benjamin Brad in the movie. I think the arrogance came through. <laughs> so, all right. So, what happens there is uh, at 1400 that afternoon, uh, the Rangers take off for Le Bon. Uh, you see here on the left, uh, Captain Robert Prince, the the commander, second command and, and commander of the of the attack force. Robert Lapham there in the middle is the one who recommended the raid and then um, uh, Juan Pajota on the, the far right. And incidentally, I, I, I think it was Pajota. I, I think it was his grandson who portrayed him in the movie, The Great mm. Raid. Yeah, I think I read that. So yeah, so let, let's just recap a bit because yeah. I think for people who don't aren't intimate with this, and mm -hmm. when we thought about the before going live, you've got various moving parts in this. It's a small operation, really. It's a reinforced yeah. company with a with some attached Alamo scouts, and then they're moving in theatre with the guerrillas. So there's there's Lapham, who's kind of local on the ground. He's been there. He's got that. Then there's the guerrilla contingent there. The Alamo scouts are the ears, eyes, reconnaissance, local experts, and, and without speaking negative about the Sixth Rangers, they are the muscle. They are the firepower. They, they, they have been well-trained, that they have had some experience, although not huge amounts there, but they are just a big, well, a, a, a firepower with machine guns and bazookas and, and, and well-trained, but without, I said to you before going live, I had to come up with something in my head this morning. Mm -hmm. The, 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 the Alamo scouts could have done their part in this mission. It would have been successful regardless of who the firepower was. Maybe they could have brought in the 513th Airborne. They could have brought a Marine Corps unit or something. But the firepower element could not have done the mission without the Alamo scouts. The integral, vital component, the, the central hub of this, in my interpretation, is the Alamo scouts. And that's not in any way knocking Moosey and the Rangers, but they are just the firepower to get this mission done. Is Am I kind of correct in my, my assessment there? Yes, absolutely. And I, I think there's one there's one layer I'm going to add to that. This Thanks. is that the, the Alamo scouts had thus far uh, participated in or conducted about oh, 60 missions prior to Luzon. They had not lost a man killed or captured. They had been in, uh, done the recon work for several uh, amphibious assaults, which had been successful. So really they had earned their, their credential. They were highly valued and highly trusted because, and, and and I'm just going to say this for what it is, Jack Dove told me that when dealing with the Filipino guerrillas, he said, what we did as a rule, we took whatever estimate they gave us and, and cut it by 60%. So if, if, they told us there was a patrol of 10 men. We we capped it off usually of four. Because for some reason, I mean, they just, whether it would get them more ammunition or it just, who knows. But the credibility gap there with the intelligence had, had, had existed. So I think what the Army said, you know what? We want our own people 
it's like having your own mechanic, your own Ford mechanic work on your Ford car. You know, yeah. They wanted they wanted somebody to provide the product that they wanted, someone they trusted. It's the glue, isn't it? It's the the, the, the yeah. down to the glue between the the gorillas who are for all their dedication and for all their yeah. passion and for all their loyalty to each other. They are a bit on the military and how they go. And I don't mean that in a negative way. They're a, they're a force you can't completely depend on in that way. Sure, well, not sure. that, that sounds really bad, but I'm not wording that very well. They're a, they're, they're, they're a force with its own limitations of captured weapons and training, and they're not professionals. And you have the Sith Rangers who are, who are firepower, but they need that to bring these two, to bring the best of them together. The Alamo Scouts are doing this connecting job. That's how I see it. Well, and, and, too that with the gorillas you look at a lot of the gorillas they they had to um to inflate the numbers for example there are ten thousand japanese in the area well if there if there was only five thousand where you only need this many rifles or this this much ammunition but if there are ten thousand well we're going to give you this many rifles or so i i think really they had to hedge up the estimates yeah. Just to, to get the equipment, to get the food, to get the support, to, to get the interest. And, and rightfully so. I mean, that's they're fighting on their own territory. They're trying yeah. to preserve their own uh, families and their own land and possessions and lives and, and so on. So, well, back to this. Uh, the, the 28th January, um, the second day in, the, the Rangers leave at 2 in the afternoon and they link up about six that night with Joseph's guerrillas near a little town or a little village called La Bong. And um, half an hour later, they leave for Balancardi, which is a little staging point. Um, at at uh, midnight, they, the Rangers and Joseph cross the Talavera River, kind of like the, the Rubicon, so to speak. Well, we're here, we're past it. Let's go. They're fully expecting to launch the raid that next morning. January 29th, okay? So at, at four in the morning, they cross the, the Rizal Road. And again, you, you're talking 121 men in this guerrilla unit, plus Alamo Scout Jack Dove, who's acting as the go-between, the liaison between the scouts and the rangers. Now, Dove had been on a previous prisoner uh, breakout at Orangebari in New Guinea. He had been the operations officer on Windy Island, running scout teams, but he was also, he was recovering from being wounded on a PT, on an attack of a PT boat. So he, he ran back, back and forth on a little native pony. <laughs> so like a little miniature thing. And he always laughed about that. But he said, I, I was just trying to keep peace between the scouts and the Rangers. So that's what he was doing going back using the bamboo telegraph or the horseshoe telegraph, as he called it once in a while. So, so but the stage is set on 29 January. Um, it's six in the morning. The Rangers arrive at Balancari and link up with Pahoda's guerrillas. Everything's set. They're looking, hey, we're, we're going to run this thing off tonight. Well, at, at uh, four that afternoon, the scouts meet with them. Nellist and Roundsville and their 13... 11 other scouts, 13 in total, had been reconning the camp. And they said, collecting uh, information from guerrillas, say, hey, we have a division near Cabana Tuan City to the, to the west. And, and Cabana Tuan was, I'll say, was a layover camp, too, for Japanese soldiers moving one place to another. They might rest outside or, you know, get some provisions, whatever. So, you didn't want a division of troops up to 7,000 showing up on your doorstep when you have a 134 men total and a, and a few yeah, we're good <laughs> a few hundred uh, under supplied guerrillas so the scouts basically convinced Musi and prince to delay the raid for 24 hours they said they will move on through and once they do we can go ahead and uh, launch the attack now, Busey didn't really want to delay it. Pretty hard. It went against his nature to wait. And the longer they waited, there's always that potential that the prisoners would be killed, mm. especially if they were detected. But they convinced him, and uh, 
in the meantime, this is where the, 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 the interesting part of the Alamo Scouts reconnaissance began. So part of the makeup of the Scouts was to have uh, actually um, Filipino-born scouts. Well, that helps with the language, the, the, the physical aspect. So Rufo Vacular, who is an older scout in his, in his 30s, actually, he, uh, he dressed up in native clothes. He and Nellis, all Nellis kind of would say, ah, I didn't do much of that. It was mostly him. And when they were, they were in a shack 300 yards in front of the camp. And they would saunter up 50, 60 yards from the camp, from the wire. They'd be counting strands of barbed wire, which way the gates opened, what kind of lock they had on them, how many towers there were, what time the guards changed, what kind of traffic. Did they see any tanks or or uh, vehicles within the compound? What was the morale? You know, or if you're familiar with a salute report, mm -hmm. size, area, location, unit, you know, the time, equipment, that sort of thing. So that's basically what the scouts were doing. They're co collecting the information to take back. And I want to stress this because this is absolutely vital because when this mission goes in, because the camp has got, what is it, 800 yards of open ground around it. There's Japanese around there of, of unknown numbers. I mean, when they started it, there could be 50, could be 100, could be 200. You can't go in with something like this in a rescue operation without knowing this data more thoroughly than it could be anywhere between 50 and 500. It's no, it's no good. And the fact these guys are walking pretty much right up the wire and noting everything down. As you say, this all this training they've done about recognizing things on the tray back at back at the selection process is all now going to be paying absolute dividends now. Because when you actually get this mission there, knowing whether there's a lock or there isn't a lock, or whether there's one gate or two gates, or knowing whether there's a ditch between the German, the Japanese barracks and the Japanese anti-tank gun, or whatever it would be, all this information is in, absolutely vital. Because when this this raid goes in. These prisoners are in potentially near death conditions. They can't run around. They're going to be panicking. The Japanese, we all know what they can do with light, light machine guns suddenly. There's armored vehicles there. This could go badly wrong very, very, very quickly. And if your information, your intelligence is faulty, everybody dies instantly in a sense. I mean, I'm being overly dramatic there. This is where the skill of the Alamo Scouts, and having watched the film this afternoon, the one line they give about, oh, the Alamo Scouts had a quick look and it's here's what we've got, doesn't really <laughs> cut the mustard in terms of understanding the resources used and the bravery and the, 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 the brilliance of this scouting um, mission by these guys walking up the wire. Incredible stuff. Yes, they, that's for anyone who watches the movie, the, the, the role of the Alamo Scouts and the guerrillas basically was, it was very understated, to be quite honest with you. And for whatever reason, who knows, but it, it, um, it was so dependent, the success of the mission was so dependent on both of those elements, and that cannot be stressed enough. But as far as getting back to the day, um, Dove took that information, he rode back and met with uh, Musi and Prince at, at two in the afternoon after the scouts had done about oh, five or six hours of recon that morning, of additional recon. Um, three that afternoon on the 30th, Prince finalizes the plan, submits it to Musi, and you can see a recreation here of kind of what, what was going on. Um, a lot of that was done. There was a, actually a photo element a photography element went with the rangers to document this thing but since so much of the movement was at night it was hard for them to take you know any good photos so a lot of things had to be recreated so at four in the afternoon on the 30th the rangers leave plateros okay an hour later the gorillas the plan was that the gorillas would establish roadblocks one at uh, cabo bridge to the east and slightly north, and at Cabanatuan City on the highway there to the south or to the west and slightly south to, to block off the, the Japanese um, uh, reinforcement efforts. Well, 
in the meantime, what would happen is once the the guerrillas were in place, the unit, the attack unit would have to move in, as you said, 800 yards over open ground. Well, I mean, that's that's just no mad. matter how stealthy you are, Lance, yeah. moving over 800 gr- yards with a few hundred, 100 plus guys is is yeah. is, is not a, a good prospect. Yeah. So at five in the afternoon, nonetheless, the scouts and the rangers they meet a mile away from from the uh, camp. They walk up a little closer. They get to about 800, 700 some yards, and then they begin to low crawl. The scout teams are already there. The Rangers join in. The Rangers go first. The scouts join one big long snake, as the scouts described it to me, heel to toe with your head down. One big long snake. Everybody had soft caps on, so there wasn't any metal da- uh, gangling and making noises, you know, canteen secured, all that sort of thing. So. He said, luckily, there was a little bit of a depression like a drainage ditch. Just a little bit lower than than the ground. They were able to get in that, that recess a little bit. So what would happen is the main part of the force to the front would get into place where a, a another assault element led by a, a Lieutenant Murphy or Captain Murphy would make their way around to the back of the camp an attack from the rear. So this and the, the scouts in their role would simply Nellis would go into the to the compound with Prince. I don't know if it was planned that way, but he did. Given his personality, I could see why he did. Roundsville uh, w- would be at the gate, and the rest of the scouts would be uh, a couple hundred yards back. And then once the prisoners came out, they would move up and usher them out of the camp and push them, get them as far away from the camp as possible. So that was the plan. So by by 7 o'clock that night, 1905, I believe the time was, the scouts and Company C are in place around the camp. So they, they've, they've snaked their way. Well, Murphy had to get into position. So it took him another 20 minutes to get in position. Once he did, then you have a night fighter, this P-61, is buzzing the camp, doing all kinds of uh, aerobatics and and drawing attention that everybody's looking up so he could get into place, diverting the attention. And of course, the prisoners are buzzed too, seeing this, what kind of plane is that? You know, so everybody's a little nervous, but everybody on the on the Allied side is in place at that point. And this is stressing again this combined arms element is that they, this you know this is this P sixty one hasn't come in by accident. This is all part of it. This is all the timing there. And I do have to give a shout out to my friend in the Philippines, Tone, Tone who's a who's a pilot, who sent me these wonderful aerial photos he took a couple of years ago. Uh, and this is the exact view. Has he? So that's Tony's wing, the strut there, flying the exact kind of angle the P sixty one would have been, showing down the, the what remains of the camp and the memorial these days. So this is what the P sixty one did, and you can imagine in the camp there, all the Japanese looking up, all the prisoners looking up, and it just buys that bit of time for for. Well, I'll let you continue the story for the for the the men on the ground caught in this in this open ground, but in this little recess, the ability to get into their final positions. For the final um the final movement and um yeah amazing stuff and that's the bridge you mentioned there and again i'll let you go back to you here's one of um tone's great photos there but it is today obviously slightly more houses and things around it now than there were at the time because the philippines is a thriving you know um uh, country now and but so lots of stuff going on there but the you know the road is still still a main artery across luzon there and you can go there and and, and next time you're in the philippines you can go there and see these locations well, and as far as the attack, here we are. We've moved up to 1945 hours. Okay, so we're looking at it's still it's still starting to get a little little twilight time. So everybody's in place. Well, the P61s they go ahead and launch an attack. Well, mute or uh, 
Prince begins the attack with a flare, with one red flare. So the shooting begins. Murphy attacks from the rear. The Rangers, everyone has their designated assignment. A guy named Richardson runs to the front, knocks the, the, the lock off with his pistol, shoots the guard. I mean, it's, it's stuff of Hollywood. And this, you see there is a, a typical uh, barracks. There, there was a barracks at a cabana farm like that. It's a thatch and not very good, raised off the ground. So the attack begins. Um, the, the attack force moves in. They're, the Japanese fire, they respond with a mortar, with a couple mortar shells. At the, and they land at the front gate where the, where the rangers are entering. Well, one of Opu, Alfonso, is uh, an Alamo scout, is wounded. He has a, a severe belly wound. Tom Roundsville, as he's proud to announce, was uh, hit with shrapnel. And Nellis was saying, where are you hit? And Roundsville says, well, in the ass, of course. <laughs> where else? They had, uh, they had quite the sense of humor, both of the, uh, Roundsville especially. But so what happens is they're at the gate. The prisoners are, are beginning to get released. Prince and his people are moving in. There's fire going on. They're busting in these barracks. Get out. Get to the front gate. We're Yanks. Well, John Cook, one of the one of the prisoners, says, "Not dressed like that. You're not." They hadn't they hadn't seen that kind of uniform, the soft cap and the, and the green mm. style uniform. They thought they were Germans. Many of the prisoners I interviewed said we thought they were Germans. We thought when the attack happened, the Japanese were trying to kill us. Some guys told me they grabbed rocks and, and got under the barracks and were ready to fight hand-to-hand -hand best they could. They had just to defend themselves, but they were so weak, they said, we could barely stand up. You know, some prisoner told me they were, they were carried like babies, some others on, on the backs of prisoners. One prisoner weighed 90 pounds. He'd been sat out on a bench and was watching the whole thing, and a guy in an Actually, an Alamo scout came by. He thought he was a ranger, but he wasn't. And he grabbed him on his back and carried him out. So the other scouts at the front of the, at the gate, they're pushing these, these, these prisoners who are running out, like uh, Galen Kittleson said, like wild cattle with their tails in the air, just running wild, trying to get out of there. Andy Smith was saying, take your clothes off. Take your clothes off. To many of them, they they wanted to see that they were white. They they wanted to keep track of the prisoners best they could. Get on, move, 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 and, and it's a lot of them were sick and wounded and tired, and they were defecating and they crying and screaming. And, and it's important to stress, I think, just the, just the mental, the mental. How they these guys have been broken yeah. by three years of captivity, the lack of food, the lack of mm -hmm. the fear. How many times have they their hopes been raised because maybe they saw an aircraft at high altitude? Perhaps the allies are coming, MacArthur's coming. Three years of this, and when you're suffering um, physically, you're suffering mentally as well. They've watched their friends die, and some of them have this, and, and their health is it's it's it's. it's it's it, you can't really imagine the state of then seeing this rescue because you don't know it's a rescue. Just say, I'm glad you made the point. There's explosions, there's fires, things bursting, there's machine gun fire. This is just absolutely terrifying, and this is you know they they haven't seen the development of the American army over the previous four years when they went captivity. The Americans are wearing the old First World One stuff. I know in this case they're wearing soft caps, not helmets at all, but the. The uniforms are different. Where are the leggings gone? Where are the Springfield rifles mm -hmm. gone? This is M1 carbines. I haven't seen these things. It's everything is new. Everything is just scary at this point. And it's it's a testament again to the planning of this. Mm -hmm. Is that more prisoners weren't just killed in just in in just confusion and panic in this situation? That that, that again the the the, the dots that the the, t the I's have been dotted, the T's have been crossed. They know what to do. They they're communicating with these prisoners. Just trust us. Go there. And they're, they're all going about their duties, the, 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 the rangers and the scouts, to make sure everybody is, is being organized correctly. It's just a testament to how well planned this was. Well, and, you know, and at the same time, they, we have two ranger action or two uh, guerrilla actions going on to the east and west of the camp. 
and yeah. they're in full-fledged firefights, and you got a Ranger bazooka team helping out with one of them. And, and I mean, there, there's some some real combat going on. There's combat in the compound where there were some 200 guards. Um, there is just a lot of stuff happening. 28 minutes later, 512 prisoners are out of that gate and on their way to, to freedom in 28 minutes. And with, with what, four hours of planning from the very beginning? And that's why many consider it the, the greatest raid in, uh, or liberation in U.S. history. Yeah. I mean, it's one of those things, isn't it? It's either going to go really well or it's going to be a complete disaster. <laughs> yeah, there's no way to can't see there being any mid-ground in this. If, 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 you know, look at the various, in the, in the, you know, me growing up in the 80s and 90s, the various te um, special forces missions to rescue, you know, hostages on aircraft. Some went really well. Some didn't go so well. It's just one of those things. If you get your timing slightly off, something goes against you, don't get a bit of luck. You just get a lucky break. You know, uh, yeah. but as you said, these guys moving through 30 miles of, of the Philippines, one Japanese patrol in the wrong place and word gets out and, and the game is lost before you even get anywhere near the camp. So or like the Kiska evacuation of the Japanese, yes, the Japanese did yesterday. There is, there's planning, leadership, audacity, um, preparedness training and also just a little bit of luck when you need it a little yeah. bit of just you know um influence somewhere at the right time you know that people have you know got their lucky rabbit's foots or their their whatever it is and, and and they got a bit of luck that day as well and and we have again this amazing record of of the of the the, the aftermath because as you say they're still 30 miles behind enemy lines they've got to get these guys away from a potentially several thousand strong uh, japanese Thing. And of course, we've got the gorillas at the, at the bridge who, mm -hmm. who are holding there. And that's you know, another show in its own right, talking about the actions of the gorillas. Mm -hmm. There's only so much. And we're coming up to an hour and 45 minutes, although it feels like 15 minutes. I mean, I'm just <laughs> loving every second. I don't care how long this goes. I'm sure. loving it. Sure. Well, you, what you see here is, is a color photograph of Carabao carts. Uh, and originally, I think they had somewhere around 25, 30 Carabao carts laid on. And it ended up um, using over 70 Carabao carts to transport the wounded and and the uh, actually the sick and the injured, trying to get them back. So it was quite a logistic operation in that regard as well. I mean, the 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 planners saying, "Hey, a lot of these guys won't be fit to walk 26 miles, 30 miles for crying out loud." They've been They've been confined for three years. So you know, th that was the gorillas and the, the local Filipinos were priceless when it came to this. And you see the Rangers taking a little break here <laughs> and rightly, rightfully so. And the Carabao carts in the background, they're stopping to eat. The, the animals are as well. So what happens, and again, this is as they're getting closer to American lines and the, the photographic uh element of the rating forces getting some good shots and and you'll see uh you know those guys look relatively good um as russ colorized this photo kind of give a little life to it and i think it makes it pop a little bit kind of yeah russ has done some sterling work behind the scenes tonight the un, the unsung hero of this show i think <laughs> absolutely there, kind of got a haunting haunting aspect to it which is commensurate with uh the what I'm sure it kind of felt like. So and I did like, I have to say, I did like the bit in the movie where they showed the, the photographers there, the army photographers were there taking the record. I thought that was good. That was, <laughs> it was a little detail for the history geeks in that, as you said there, there were <laughs> photography teams there and they couldn't do much at night because of the flash photography, giving away the game to the enemies. They couldn't, but they do get <laughs> captured it. There's, I put one of the links in the description below folks. There's a seven or eight minute national archives footage. there, silent where you see, um, the colonel, you see various other scouts and the rangers milling about there, and you see the prisoners having their first cigarettes and their 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 their, um, their food. And this is another thing we've gone up the other tangent is that you can't give these these guys too much food too quickly either because of their health concerns. That they have to have medical people with these teams to make sure they're they're treated correctly. Because the last thing you do with these guys is give them loads of D ration chocolate bars and 
and uh, because that has adverse effect on them, they, sure. their stomachs can't handle it. So that, that they've got to. And again, this I know we we could we talk about that, but the planning has included what state these POWs might be in and what care they would need back once they've got them out. That's all been thought of. It's not a question of rescuing them. Oh my God, what are we going to do with them now? That's all been kind of thought out, isn't it? Sure, sure. So what 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 happened? What the plan was is once that all the prisoners were out past the. The, the river, which really wasn't much of a river, it was just a you know a knee deep, to get the prisoners out, the main the main body would go forward with Musi and all the rangers and and push. Well, it just so happens that one of the rangers, uh, Captain Fisher, the battalion surgeon, was killed or he was severely fatally injured actually uh, during the raid and died later. The scouts were staying behind at the other side of the river to make sure that the Japanese weren't chasing, that one of the units didn't get through and they weren't, wouldn't pursue the prisoners and kill them because they would have, it would have been like shooting a fish in a barrel. Yeah. So, you know, the, the, the movement was slow at best. So, so the scouts remained there. Dove went with the main group and the, and the other 13 remained behind a, as a rear guard. Well, once Fisher was with the, the scouts. They got to Balancari, and he had to be operated on. Musi told the scouts, hey, I'll send a plane back. Have him operated on by a local doctor. Cut an airstrip. So it that night, the Filipinos, the local population, the scouts, they cut an airstrip out of the area and wait for a, a Cub plane to come and evacuate Fisher, but it never happened. And that's where there's been a little bit of rub between the, the Alamo Scout team leaders and, uh, quite frankly, Musi. And, and it's, you know, there's two sides to every coin, but their side is what we're talking about, and they buried him there. Uh, Herbot, who was a wonderful gentleman, um, he was a veterinarian in the camp. And he, he was one of the ones that stayed behind. And he, he reco recounted what the scouts told me. And he said, you know, we all thought, and Fisher thought, that that plane would come back and get him. But it did not. And so for whatever, I mean, there's casualties in every situation. You know, he just happened to be one with, along with one other, one other um, ranger. And two scouts wounded. Like I said, uh, um, Alfonso was, uh, he was eventually evacuated. Well, anyway, they buried, they buried Fisher there. There's a memorial there today. And then the scouts started making their way back by another alternate route. Well, one of the, one of the interesting stories along the way is they encountered a group of Hukbalahaps, which were the, actually a, a communist uh, group operating there in the Philippines and they they would uh, they stopped then the scouts had some of the weaker prisoners with them as well and Nellis said um, we're, we're the US we he said we're the goddamn US Army and we're going through and Kittleson charged his 45 and said move aside Bill we'll just blow them all to hell and the Huckball hops just go on through, and that's been that's been verified by every scout mm. who was there. They said it was it was too good to be in a movie. <laughs> so, mm. and that was the type of bravado that Roundsville and Nellis and these other scouts had in the moment. They were the man for the occasion, for the the men for the occasion. Nellis was it was a an extraordinary leader, as was Roundsville. And it's not surprising, given that the Sixth Rangers and Alamo Scouts hadn't worked together before, they wouldn't have much to do with each other again, that their, their versions of the history diverge slightly and they have their different little views. I think that's just not how it is. That's how it is in any units that work alongside each other. They they see things. That, that is what, that's why we love, are fascinated by history, is the interpretation of it. 
and and where you know things happen and and, and anal analysis is done post event and could they have done more and could this have happened and could that have done of course these things happen and um, um, it, it, just to, to get back to the power, what are we looking at here because this is an, this is this is an amazing document by the look of it okay this is um, this is a request for trucks we need trucks because once they got to Sybil Springs and it's like hey you know what I think we're safe enough I think we're good. Send trucks, send ambulances, get these people to uh, Gimba, get a, uh, let's take care of our, our men. And that's what they did. See, Russ did a colorization of that, and that was a nice photo. They're the first ambulance to arrive right there. You see, they have four men in that. And I believe they were taken to the 92nd Evac Hospital. And a funny side note, uh, Roundsville went and visited. Roundsville and Nellis went to visit them and uh, said they were stopped by a nurse who was tough as the Japanese at, at the camp. And he's, he finally said, get the hell out of my way. He said, we won't be long. And it, they pushed their way through. And he said, probably wasn't the right thing to do, but we smuggled in a couple beers for some of the prisoners. <laughs> he mm -hmm. said they were all very grateful. And he said uh, it, it started a a a lifelong love affair with the prisoners with the for the Alamo scouts and the rangers and, and i just I, I can't believe how amazing how 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 many of these images we have here and uh, you know sure. I'm, I'm conscious of the fact we're coming up to two hours and i'm, I'm loving every minute of it but you know people are going to get uh have the things to do and people might want <laughs> toilet breaks at some point but yeah i mean it, it's it's an extraordinary presentation. I'm loving every second of it, and you can you know, these photos convey so much in terms of um, of the relief and the joy and the and the. the you know, I can't possibly imagine what it'd be like to be liberated from a prisoner war camp and confusion first and disbelief, and then you realise because these these photos are going to be hours, if not even a couple of days. Then some of them because you know they, they're getting back to the hospitals now. Things mm -hmm. have had a chance to sink in a bit. Um, immediately after it's very fraught very very tense they've got to get them on the wagons out there but later on as you can start to see now like this photo there the, the understanding of what it really means is starting to appear on their faces now yes and you know after this raid um the scouts uh, rounds of el nellis together told me this we were we were in uh in colorado and they said right after the raid um because of what happened with fisher he said musi called them into the office at Sixth Army headquarters and asked them to join the Rangers. He said, I'll make, I'll promote you to captain and you can join the Rangers. They said, nah, nah, no, no, we're not going to do it. Well, to go one step further, it's funny that the Rangers and the Alamo scouts ended up in Japan together in the same barracks with bed bugs and lice so bad <laughs> he said they actually all the men they got along great with the rangers it was just really that that little that that little conflict at the very very top but um all of the all of the enlisted men received bronze stars for this um the officers got the silver star and musi and prince got the distinguished service cross and everyone there uh, got the presidential unit citation which which tells you everything and, yeah. and this guy you sent me there you know the first mat first in last out the alamo scouts and that that that's the thing isn't it this as we said earlier i'm repeating myself the the rangers provide this firepower they provide the muscle the strength but the scouts are doing the the vital prep and 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 for this and and so so I'll, I'll let you carry on there, but because you know you put this slide in there for a reason. So what's what's the meaning behind this one? Well, those are the grid coordinates of Cabanatuan. Right. <laughs> so it really, uh, actually, one of the one of the actors who was on the film, The Great Raid, uh, sent that that slide to me. Mm. And he, he felt the scouts were underrepresented. He played an Alamo scout. And that they were underrepresented in the movie. They didn't even use Roundsville and Nellis' last names in the movie. Now, yeah. this, this man is as fine as – you could do a show on this man here. Jack Dove. I mean, that's from Hollywood, California, nonetheless. Didn't drink, didn't smoke, and uh, 
killed several men with his bare hands. He was just a an incredible force and and a liberator in, in many ways. And he was this this was caught on a film clip of him handing out cigarettes to the prisoners at the end. And he told me, he says, Lance, those cigarettes were worth more than food. The, the, the prisoners wanted those before they wanted the food. See, I was given a couple packs to every prisoner. And he said they, they had a, you know, Jeeps full of them. Yeah. He said, and incidentally, his wife was sitting in a movie theater a week later when this aired on Movie Tone. Wow. And, and saw that. And she, she was telling me about it. And she just started screaming. This was a, a group shot that, that I colorized taken after the after the raid. There's uh, Nellis to the left, Roundsville to the right following the raid. Absolutely superb stuff. And here, now this is one area that really hasn't been delved much into, but after the raid, it was so such a spectacular event which electrified the nation. Um, the, the word came down from the War Department, get these guys back over here. So two scouts who had had college, the enlisted men, were selected. Harold Hard from Coldwater, Michigan, and Gil Cox from Enterprise, Oregon, were selected from the scouts along with 10 Rangers to come to the United States on a 30-day war bond tour. Well, you see here in this, this document here um, that, that Hard and... Prince were on an edition of We the People, a radio program, and they're trying to sell the <laughs> sell a recording to Hard's uh, family on this particular. And yeah, thing. and these photos of yeah, there's yeah, Bing Crosby there. This was this yeah. made the press. It was a big morale boost, and you know we. I, I, it's amazing these guys got the credit, and they went back and the war bonds drives. I can't help having in my head, Lance, the what happened in Manila, Manila just the, frankly days after this, because yeah. that's the other side of it. This has been a great success. There's 511 prisoners, so not just Americans. There were some Dutch there, a couple of other nationalities there, some civilian things, but huge success, just minimal, minimal casualties on the Allied side. A few of the guerrillas were killed. And yet just the days later, we have that absolute horror of what happened in Manila. Yeah. And I put the link in, folks, if you haven't seen it yet. We had James Scott on a couple of weeks ago talking about his book, Rampage. And that's this thing I always try and do on World War II TV is, is connecting the dots and adding the context. Because, unfortunately, that's how wars go. For every brilliant success where you can say, fantastic, brilliant, great, there's this other side. There's a darker side that's happening at the same time. And it's important to understand that this... For these prisoners, the war is over. Their health is going to be restored. For the Philippines, there's a hell of a lot of hell on earth coming very, very quickly. And and I don't want to make people leave this show thinking that the Philippines is now liberated. Everything is all peachy there because there's a whole lot of crap coming their way very, very quickly, which, again, we cover in the show with James Scott. So I urge people to go and watch on a, a that. You know, that's not what we're talking about that today. We're talking about the Alabama Scouts. We're talking about the Rangers. And that photo says it all. This if it goes to the very top, this doesn't it? You know, I mean, March seventh. That's one of their first stops. They they flew them over to the United States. They met with the president here in the Oval Office. To the far right, you see Gil Cox's face, and then right over Roosevelt's right shoulder is Harold Hard, the other Alamo scout. So yeah, there they are in uh, with the president, and and he said to him, "It won't be." It won't be much longer, guys. And it, he's true. It wasn't much longer. This actually, uh, I believe Roosevelt's final in-person meeting occurred this day before he went to Warm Springs and uh, suffered a stroke and died. He, he doesn't look well in that photo. It's very yeah. poor, quote, but he, he looks, with, with what we know happened very, very shortly after, he doesn't look well. Yeah, the scout said he, uh, Gil Cox told me he was very frail, but he, he was he's very... Uh, very pumped up by the raid, <laughs> and, yeah. and he yeah, went, yeah. he shook everybody's hand individually, and it, it was pretty neat for him too. It'd been a long war. Uh, you, an example of the scouts uh, appearing in a uh, in a magazine article um, about the raid. Um, on the next one, that's a Alamo scout team at the end of the war as they went into Japan. Um, 
in the occupation. You notice that that patch on that right shoulder, which sells for over three thousand dollars a piece now. Only four hundred and forty of those were made. That's why they're so so rare. Okay, next in Japan. See a few of the scouts. Um, an adventure magazine, a men's magazine from 1960, and it, really one of the best accounts of the raid. I mean, extensive with a with a little bit of a <laughs> bit of license, yeah, but, yeah. but still, yeah. Uh, my book. And, and, we, and we should, you know, we can, I said it earlier on. You know, the, 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 I'm going to be bold and say the best work on this has now been yours. I know you, so as far as I'm concerned, you're my go-to guy about Alamo scouts and. I urge people to go and get the full, complete story because Russ is saying, others are saying that we're only getting, despite it being two hours, you could probably talk about this for five or six or seven or eight hours and it's just extraordinary stuff. And so wh where do you think the Alamo Scouts sit? In What's their legacy today? What do you wish was was known about them? What's the what's the focus of the foundation you're involved with? What's the What's the game plan these days? Okay, thank you for that for the, those questions, because I, I think they're very important moving forward. You'll see some of the literature on the scouts. Uh, Hampton Sides, an outstanding author. His book is as good as it gets about the Cabana Tuan raid. So please read that. The previous slide you had with Forrest Johnson, this was the first effort written in 1977. And, and Pahoda actually, and, and Josen, he interviewed them in the Philippines. They came to the United States and stayed with him. Uh, people were relatively young still at that time. Uh, Forrest Johnson really did the first groundbreaking work as far as a literary work on um, on the Scouts and Cabana Tuan and basically brought them out a little bit. And Brewer followed up, and The Great Raid was based on his book and on uh, Hampton Sides. But really, you see there's the... The, the cover and James Franco uh, for the movie. But to, to your point, Paul, and to your questions and the actors is the scouts, I think when you place them in the context of who they were, what did they contribute? Well, I think in their theater, I think they did great by the sixth army. I think they, they fulfilled their mission. They saved a lot of lives. At the end of the day, I think what you look at is were the subsequent missions that they that they provided information into that was developed into intelligence, did it save lives? Did it help accomplish a, a mission, achieve a, an objective, and ultimately shorten the war? And that, that's what we're looking at. It, we're looking at the end game here now as from a historical perspective. So were they successful in that? Absolutely. They were successful because they, they, they took volunteers, uh, incredible men to begin with, specialized training, intense training, uh, intelligent training. And, and it all began with the caliber of the men. And they were used for the, for the purpose they were created for. They were not misused. So I think the lessons there, and, and we didn't mention this, but they were an ad hoc unit, which means they were just simply developed for a specific time, for a specific mission, and they, they had no lineage. They were effectively disbanded after the war. Well, there was our mistake. The mm. scouts basically shut up, went back to their lives, and the lessons learned were largely ignored or forgotten or or vanished. And, and in many ways, the special forces had to relearn some of the lessons as far as in, in the jungle environment that the scouts, I think, could have taught them had they utilized, their, the government utilized the resource better. Now, when Volkman got together with Aaron Bank and others and in the 50s, early 50s, and formed special forces, they took some of those lessons, but I'm not sure how much, I can't find any evidence that that they were interviewed, the scouts were interviewed. Now, Nellis was recruited by the CIA for his special skills. He was a California rifle champion. So we can all imply or infer what that means, but 
in, in, in the end game, I, I think the lessons were lost. Now you see there, that's John Cook, who is a champion of the scouts in the ring. He was a, a, a POW. Uh, this is Robert Prince to the left and Bob Sumner representing the Alamo Scouts at the um, the Ranger Alamo Scout Memorial dedication on August 11th, 2000. Now I have to say, I would have been there, but that's my daughter's birthday. And How I, inconvenient I, is that, Lance? And I, mean, I, I don't know who's, well, oh, all this expert planning and it goes wrong like that. Terrible. Well, I did. I did get the hat. the hat. They did send me a, the hat. So <laughs> I had to get that in. She's my uh, tech, my tech expert that helps me. So I wanted to make sure everybody saw that. Here you see a memorial stone that was dedicated at the uh, at the Airborne and Special um, Operations Forces uh, Memorial. And Bradshaw Hall. Now this at the Special Operations Missions Training Center there at Fort Bragg with the Green Berets. You notice it's Colonel Frederick W. Bradshaw. So it had to go through a highly competitive uh, of um, process where they evaluated people and and I actually had to dig up a lot of stuff for Bradshaw and and kind of validate what he did and I am just thrilled for his family. He died in 1946, 40 years of age of heart attack. But they saw that he was such a trainer and he was he's so innovative and, and forward thinking that they named this training center in his honor. So it is now Bradshaw Hall. And they train special ops people all over the world. Here you see Raphael Alito. He was a lieutenant general, went on to become the Minister of National Defense under Ferdinand Marcos. Uh, Bob Shirky, the last major, uh, last general to on active duty to have fought against the Japanese. Irv Ray, a major general in the Air Force. And here, Herbert Wolf. Um, an amazing story who started out in the Hitler youth in the 1930s, mm. came over in 39, graduated high school as a sophomore. He was brilliant. Later became a uh, um, uh, quite a U.S. Forces Europe commander. I mean, they have an incredible, incredible group to draw on the personalities and the accomplishments. Uh, um, Bo Derrick, if you've ever, if you remember her, her husband John Derrick yep. was an Alamo scout. Believe it or not, okay. The the movie uh, Walking Tall and and Ben and Willard. And he did the awful war movie with, uh, with uh, Once Before I Die. Ursula Andress, isn't it? Nineteen yes. I'm a real movie. That's a terrible, terrible. He was film. married to all those. <laughs> yeah, he, he he had he was one of those guys who had all the all the hot women, didn't he? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, he, yeah and, and obviously the Alamo Scout in him. That's how he got the hot women. I mean. Charles Pratt, the director of the Walking Tall series of the 1970s, he was an Alamo scout. I mean, you have some, you have some incredibly accomplished people here. Um, yeah. Now, to your point about the Alamo Scouts Historical Foundation, our yeah. job simply we're a not not for profit organization, and we continue to do archival research for and about the Alamo Scouts. We produce a, a magazine called Recon that. Uh, I predominantly write the the articles, and Russ does a magnificent job on the graphics and puts that together. And if people join up as part of the membership, and it's only twenty five dollars a year to become a member to, of the Scouts, and that funds our some of the memorials and the tomb, the stones you saw. We we actually try to honor the men and the legacy of the unit of what they did at national level museums, at uh, um, uh, military bases, you, you name it. It's just well, I mean, I can only thank you on behalf of the of the World War II community, you and the association, Russ and the others there for doing this work, because, you know, it is important that we understand the, the legacy of what these guys gave us. And I think to give it a context as usual, you know, we can now see that perhaps in 1945, lessons weren't learned immediately. And we can say see that around with other things and other forces that were disbanded too quickly. But I suppose you have to understand the context of the time. Everybody's war weary. There's, there's 
life to get on with people are thinking about marrying and having babies and getting the economy back on again and i can kind of forgive uh, and understand why some of these lessons are i mean that is the yep. that is the single lesson from history is the one the one constant in his history is that we never learn from our mistakes until it's too late. That is the one thing that we 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 keep proving that we can learn from history, but we don't. We or two, we don't until, it, right. until we've already missed the bus, and that's that is the ultimate problem of it. But I think you know this this what we've done tonight is we've talked about um, where they sit in within this legacy. We've given we've paid homage to what they did on the raid itself. And I, I I feel you could come back on and talk about some of these these characters because we've we've talked about formation, training, objectives, the operation, but you know you're you're tossing these names out there, these incredible people. We could we could do something, perhaps bring Russ on as well and do something about them in the future. Because I feel there's more to tap into there. But in terms of um you know you said about the aims of the association just before yeah. we go there are you getting young people interested in this? Because that is the thing with veterans associations is as the participants in the war have mostly passed away, you need the kids, you need the grandkids, but also you need life from outside of that as well. To sure. come into is it still thriving? Are you getting new people coming in? Well, and, and, and I'll be frank with you, you know, it's tough. I mean, when you compete against game systems and, and, and the immediacy and the, the ADHD of the whole society as a whole, you know, to get somebody to sit down and read an article or to read a book, if it doesn't hit you in 30 seconds, I mean, uh, I'll find something quicker I can get to. But on the other side of the coin, we, we've recently found a, a young man. We've established a scholarship through donations of, of the members, and we've named our first recipient of the Alamo Scouts Historical Foundation Memorial Award for a scholarship, a monetary scholarship. And we've identified that there are some young people out there. And this, this young man, his name's uh, uh, Michael Naya, and he's a, a college sophomore, and he's just on fire about this stuff. And those are the type of people we're trying to reach out who can, who are motivated to do further research, who take an interest in the past and 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 convey to a, a younger audience that it's not dry and dusty. If you explore the personalities and, and the life and the color behind the dusty pages, that's yeah. that's what makes Hollywood movies. That's what yeah. makes bestsellers is to get behind the the the, the the battlefield details. Yeah, and and you're rather like myself in that, you know, there are World War II history channels that have got tens of thousands of followers and their yeah. shows are watched by hundreds of thousands because they cram everything into a five minute presentation. Mm -hmm. And I'm not saying there isn't a place for that. And I'm not saying I don't watch some of those things myself, but me sitting here talking to you for two hours is not everybody's cup of tea. I mean, yeah, right. I think it's the way history should go. And I like these deep dives. I like the fact and I, I again, I want to pay testament to people like Lorelai and Willie and Russ and the others who are watching this show is that they are, they are, there are people out there, maybe not millions of them, but they do understand about history. They do care about these people. They do understand that there are, there are valuable lessons we can learn from what these people did about, about how to go forward with, with problems. The world is in the middle of a pandemic now. And I think mm -hmm. learning what these people did and how resourceful they can be and how they work together is, is a, is a lesson we could do with learning a bit more all the time. Um, and I think that's how I really want to leave it with you now, Lance, is just there's, there's lessons to be learned from this that we can take forward into what we're doing today in 2021. So, well, I've, I've, I've had a brilliant time talking to you. I'll just remind people what we've got coming up tomorrow, then I'll come back and say goodbye in a second. So folks, Tomorrow, we're off to Romania and Odessa for an amazing show about the SS trying to smoke out a Romanian resistance fighters up with Grant Harewood tomorrow. That'll be really good. And then I've got a couple of days break where I'm going off to Dieppe to do some filming, and then it all starts again next week with lots more stuff. So uh, as usual, keep in touch with us on Twitter. Follow what we're doing on social media. Check us out on Patreon. Lance's website is in the description below. Get his books on PDF Maybe consider becoming a member of the foundation. Reach out to these people. Learn about what these people did. Because to me, the Alamo Scouts is deserving of more attention, more praise, more gratitude, and more to learn. So that's my message out now. But right now, it remains for me to say thank you very much, Lance, for joining us. Did you enjoy it? Oh, what what fun. 
Thank you so much. Great time. I mean, that, the two hours has absolutely flown by. Um, so there you are. It's been absolutely brilliant. So, well, folks, thank you very much for sticking with us. I think some people did kind of drift away a bit because they've already had to go and have dinner or have lunch or something, but they'll come back and watch it on catch up. I think this is one of the most important shows we've done for some time because it's highlighting a unit that I don't think has had as much attention. And I, I get emails all the time saying, why don't you do more stuff on the 101st Airborne? Well, I do occasionally do stuff on the 101st Airborne. But, folks, there were other units involved in World War II. It's not all about the 101st Airborne. As good as they were, there are other units that deserve this praise. So there we are. I will leave it at that. Thank you very much, Lance. Thanks, Russ. Thanks, Trent. Thanks, Lorelai. Thanks, Angela. Thanks, everybody else who's enjoyed this. This is Paul Woodhead for World War II TV saying enjoy the rest of your day. Thank you, everybody, for watching. See you tomorrow if you are ready for another show of more information. <laughs> Thanks, everybody. See you then. Yeah. Bye.